Good afternoon, North Dakota. Thanks for joining us today. And for those uh, watching online or on TV, we appreciate uh, your patience as we sorted through uh, uh, <clears throat> some technical difficulties, but we uh, everything's now working. So thanks to the tech team for getting everything up and going. Uh, it's always a good reminder when we begin these uh, COVID press conferences, press briefings, uh, to remind ourselves as a state what our strategic goals have been and what our focus has been on since the start of the pandemic. So let's just begin with the why. Uh, we've used the phrase uh, often uh, about talking about saving lives and livelihoods. But when we talk about this, <clears throat> we're not just focusing strictly on physical health, but also on mental health, behavioral health, economic health, uh, which are also key factors uh, to, to well-being. Uh, <clears throat> and, and of course, part of this we know uh, for mental health and economic health has to do with getting uh, all of our kids back in school. And so with our K-12 smart restart and the healthy return to learning uh, efforts, again, we've, we've had a, we're off to a, uh, at least so far so good, largely successful start to the school year. Uh, the School teams are continuing to learn as they go and make uh, make make smart decisions to help uh, allow our our students to to be in school and stay in school. And a number of districts are moving towards more five day learning as opposed to hybrid as a way to reduce transmissible moments by having kids in their cohorts. Uh, we've also been really focused on uh, protecting the most vulnerable among us, which is the elderly and those with underlying health conditions, where we know that this uh, coronavirus virus can be particularly uh, deadly. Uh, and with our vulnerable population protection plan, we've been a national regard, national leader in that regard. And, and of course, uh, by doing all of these things, again, the one way we save lives, uh, particularly among those most vulnerable, is that we all do our part to help slow the spread uh, so we can ensure that we've got adequate healthcare capacity, that's in both in terms of healthcare staff, whether that's in terms of long-term care staff or at hospital or clinic staff, uh, and then we've got the right equipment and treatment. And, and of course, again, by slowing the spread, uh, we know a lot more than we did six months ago and a person's ability to likely uh, survive even a serious bout of with COVID-19 is better today than it was uh, six months ago. And you see that by the dropping fatality rates across our nation. Uh, uh, there are some uh, areas for concern. One of those is we we do track, you know, we're, as everyone knows, we're testing, uh, trying to test uh, residents and uh, long-term care health workers uh, uh, weekly. And we've seen a positive rates increase uh, in the past couple of weeks, both among staff and of residents. And well, the long-term positive rate is still below the community positive rate. Uh, this the, Over the weekend, it was 4.7% uh, uh, for residents and 59 for staff. Uh, and that, again, for staff then starts to reflect what we've said, which is if the staff are in the community, uh, they can often start reflecting the the rate that's in a community. and But that's just too high. We've been fortunate, we've been low in the number of fatalities here in North Dakota, uh, but we know that where those numbers can start to rise is if infection gets into congregate living like long-term care. And and so again, we need to continue to continue to remain really vigilant uh, against the uh, virus to protect our most vulnerable and to keep our schools opening. So we're continuing to watch those numbers closely. Uh, if we can bring rapid screening tests to bear, uh, perhaps that can help us uh, to facilitate uh, visitation uh, and do that safely. Uh, and, and continue to look at other things we can, other changes we can make. But we know that we've got a number of, of long-term care facilities that have been hit uh, relatively hard, and we know that this is, this is a real risk for us. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, when community uh, spread happens in cities and towns, it's more likely to end up in our nursing homes and no one uh, wants that. And when we talk about protecting the elderly and the most vulnerable, it's not just those that are currently residing in long-term care facilities, because uh, as we've talked about from the onset, uh, 
sadly about 20% of North Dakotans, uh, which would be close to 150,000 people would fall into a category of having uh, <clears throat> the high risk uh, comorbidities uh, with the, with COVID like heart disease, obesity, or diabetes, uh, or other uh, related uh, health issues that, that cause, can cause really serious illness or death uh, with COVID. Uh, we also know that there's COVID fatigue out there, <clears throat> but again, whether when we talk about everyone, whether it's healthcare workers to businesses, business owners to students, uh, we ask everyone to, to keep fighting the fight because what you, what you do makes a difference for those that are most vulnerable, and it also can help, as you say, keep our schools open. Uh, we know that we've got a challenge uh, in keeping our schools open relating to protecting our uh, teacher workforce, and we know that we've got a shortage of, of substitute teachers around the state, and so again, the work that you do, uh, <clears throat> the work that you can each individually do can help us protect uh, teachers and keep our kids in school, which is great for the kids and their mental uh, well-being being and as well as their education. And if you're being smart about the being around the community, you can also keep our healthcare workers safe that, that are maybe, uh, that you may, may be next to you when you're shopping. Uh, they may be sitting next to you in church, uh, but these are folks that when they go to work, they're going to work with our most vulnerable. And so again, we wanna get back, talk about the North Dakota smart guidelines that we always do, uh, which has to do with, again, uh, social distancing, wearing face masks, avoiding large large gatherings, washing your hands frequently. These are all uh, important things that we can do. Uh, and then again, I wanna just put an extra note that we haven't mentioned before, but if you're one of those individuals that has been tested positive, uh, even if you're young and asymptomatic, I would like to just say that you've got an extra responsibility and if you're positive and your responsibility is to make sure that during the time that you're contagious that you do not infect anyone else. If every single person in our state right now, which is uh, the all of the actives in our state, if all of those actives, the 2,758 actives, if each of those we're really diligent about making sure they didn't infect anybody else, uh, we could take this virus down dramatically in a hurry. Uh, and so again, if you're someone who's positive or a close contact of a positive, you have an extra responsibility to help, to help slow the spread. So again, thank you for what you're doing. <clears throat> when we take a look at the numbers from this last, uh, over the last seven day period, 2,049 new cases, uh, 1,200 114 uh, recovered and 14 deaths reported over the last week. We're now at 2,758 active confirmed cases. Uh, I would just share an observation which we're trying to drive more into the data, but <clears throat> typically on uh, Tuesdays is often a day when we see a, a bigger increase in recoveds because while we do do testing over the weekend, sometimes people that present for testing on a weekend are those people that say, I can't wait to get a test until Monday. Monday because I'm symptomatic and, and we have seen an increase in uh, recent weeks of the number of people that are testing that are symptomatic. Uh, but then on Monday is usually when people might be touching base with a physician uh, or they're clearing their period of time when they're recovered. And so uh, I would expect, uh, we do have some individual day variances between uh, when we see positive new cases versus when we see recovered. And again, that's why we like to look at these over a seven day or 14 day uh, period. <clears throat> Uh, but with the 2,049 confirmed cases identified out of 39,125 tests in the last week, that brings the last week's positive rate of tests to 5.2% uh, as positive tests divided by the percentage of total tests. Uh, and again, uh, we'll talk more about this today about calculating percentages, uh, but this is the way the CDC has done it. And now thankfully, this is also the way the COVID, uh, the CBC COVID of a data tracker calculates positivity. So that's, uh, we're, we've always been in line with that. We'll talk later about some of the volunteer non-government sites, but this is the, this number matches the CDC uh, site. We have now, uh, 
completed uh, just over 546,000 tests of North Dakotans. And of course, the strategy in doing this comprehensive and robust testing is to make an invisible enemy visible. And again, uh, we'll thank everybody involved in, that te in this testing effort because it has helped us do almost better than any other state, identify where the virus is and give us the, the information we need to try to control its spread. When we take a look at the 14-day average uh, has remained relatively flat uh, in recent days, and this is good news. Uh, today it's at 5.65 on the rolling, uh, the rolling uh, uh, 14 day, which is slightly higher than the 5.2, which is the weekly. Uh, so again, this is a good that we're staying here in the low fives. Uh, and we like it when it's going flat. We'd like to have it be going down uh, overall as a state because we want to get back under 5% is where we're trying to shoot for. Uh, I would say that again, when we say it's been relatively flat, as you'll hear, it's a combination of, of that rate going down in some parts of the state and going up in other parts of the state. We do have various rates of positive test rate and various rates of infection rate around the state. Currently, there's 65 people that are hospitalized and uh, and again, uh, we do have people that have said, well, gee, why are you doing all of this work? Because we aren't using much hospitalization. I would say we have low hospitalization because of all the great work that North Dakotans have been doing. And so again, I wanna just say thank you to everybody who's doing their part uh, to be North Dakota smart, because you're helping, you are helping to save lives and you're helping to keep people out of the hospital. And again, uh, we are, have been relatively flat for several weeks and with 65 people hospitalized, that's a very small percentage of our hospital capacity going towards COVID. Our hospitals are very busy uh, and some of them are are uh, doing a lot of business because people are coming back in for elective surgeries, et cetera. We have sadly in the uh, uh, last seven days, and there have been 14 deaths. Uh, this is uh, spanning uh, eight men and six women from their 50s to their 90s. Uh, six of those were from right here in Burley County. Uh, but again, we want to say to all of those uh, families and friends who've lost a loved one during this pandemic uh, that our hearts and prayers go out to, to each of them. <clears throat> From an active cases standpoint of North Dakota's 53 counties, uh, all but four of them have at least one active case. Currently, uh, the, the state, the counties that have no active cases are shown in gray. Uh, the darker the color of the county, the more cases that there are. And, and uh, right here in uh, Burley Morton is uh, where we've got the highest number of active cases, 513 active cases in Burley, 216 active cases found in Morton County for a combined 729 active cases here. That's 25% of the active cases in the state approximately. But other large metros, as it often has been during this uh, pandemic around the country and around our state, uh, the virus tends to show up more in places where we've got higher density of population and more transmissible moments uh, in uh, either commercial or public spaces. So other counties with high active case counts include Cass County with 480, Grand Forks County with 273, Stark County with 249, Ward County with 197, Williams County with 171, and Stutzman uh, at 160. And if you take a look at these eight counties, which represent some of our, and also include our, our uh, larger metro areas, these eight counties uh, represent 82% of the active cases statewide. And how do you make that actionable? Well, if you live in uh, one of the 45 counties that's not one of the ones, eight that has the 82 active cases, so if you don't live in, in <clears throat> Burley or Morton or Grand Forks or Stark or Cass or Ward or Williams or Stutzman, but you live in a surrounding area and you drive to one of these areas uh, for travel, for shopping, for appointments or for other activities, Activities, uh, again, uh, take extra precaution when you go to those in terms of social distancing, uh, wearing a mask, uh, practicing good hand hygiene when you're traveling those and reduce. And, and something we talked about
about early on, uh, but it's been uh, proven out by some large scale studies that have been done and makes, just makes complete common sense. But if you were to, those individuals that figured out a way to say consolidate and go shopping one day a week, as opposed to shopping seven days a week, uh, fewer trips uh, to commercial locations, uh, consolidating those created fewer transmissible moments, and in some cases dramatically reduced uh, the likelihood of someone getting the infection. So again, if you're living outside these uh, more, uh, more areas with more cases, uh, take extra care when you're traveling to them. On the next thing we want to uh, talk about is the uh, the the counties. Uh, well, I guess we're going to talk about that a little bit later. We're going to talk right now. I think we're going to talk about uh, the COVID uh, tracking update. COVID tracking update uh, is a site. COVID tracking project is a volunteer site uh, that is staffed by volunteers, originally created by the Atlantic Magazine. So it's a non-governmental volunteer site. Uh, they early on we're filling a need uh, and we're doing uh, pulling data from lots of different sources and it became a easy place for national news organizations and even health agencies or health organizations like Johns Hopkins to pull data from. Uh, we have been working throughout the summer to try to get the the data on COVID data, the COVID tracking project, this volunteer site to match what the CDC had and what North Dakota had. Uh, the fact that it didn't led to a number of national articles where North Dakota's uh, positivity rate was, was uh, misrepresented in some cases by almost a factor of four times higher in national articles than, than the reality. And this was because they were not uh, counting all of our tests. Uh, in, and we have been able to connect last week. We had good, good, uh, I'd say finally, uh, connection with COVID tracking project team, and they have, uh, are, we have come to uh, an understanding agreement about definitions of what test encounters mean, uh, and, a, and that definition that they're using on test encounters has been added to our website. Test encounters is a number that is extremely close to what we uh, called total tests, uh, as opposed to they were pulling a number for the individual, different individuals to test, but because of our high rate of serial testing, uh, meaning testing like residents in an long-term care facility every week. Uh, that, that testing, all still PCR, all still gold standard testing, these are all the, the very best of tests, but because we were doing a lot of that, which we know uh, even relative to our peer group in the FEMA region, uh, we're doing anywhere between three and 10 times the rate of testing of the other five states in the region, which includes Colorado, Montana, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Uh, so with this, uh, coll collaboration and syncing up with the COVID tracking project. We're one of six states now that reports test encounters along with New York, Rhode Island, Washington, Virginia, and Colorado. And, uh, and of those four states, only four also report the unique people tested, which we've been doing uh, since the get-go. So we're along with Rhode Island, Colorado, and Washington. Uh, and then also, uh, uh, we, we'll, so now we've not taken anything away because we're committed to transparency as well as being data driven. And so we now, the state will, we're the only state which is providing all three metrics. One is encounters, uh, the second is total specimens or total tests, and the third is unique individuals uh, that were that were uh, tested. And we like to think, of course, everybody in North Dakota is unique, but what we mean by that is that uh, it, the, the, if someone got tested more than once, we only counted them once in the unique people uh, category. Uh, as anyways, a result of all this work, the bottom line is we're now seeing our positive rate being accurately reported uh, at the same levels that we're talking about here uh, by most, but not all organizations. But when COVID tracking fixed theirs, a few days later it flowed through and now it's being correctly reported by Johns Hopkins, uh, et cetera. But yet some uh, are still aren't telling the whole uh, story. And as we have gone from a nationally, again, it's important to note that as a country, uh, the great things are happening on this front. We've gone, even with increased testing across the nation, uh, we've gone from 66,000 new cases per day in late July down to about 40,000 per day in mid-September. That uh, is a, should be a huge headline because we're absolutely positively as a country going in the right direction. But as this uh, 
virus has spread around the country, first in the Northeast, then in the South, then the Southwest. Uh, it is now making its way through the Midwest, and we've seen a number of uh, states in the Midwest with with higher number of higher number of uh, cases. Uh, <clears throat> but again, we want to make sure that we're understanding and telling the whole story. Over the weekend, uh, there was a national article about the Dakotas leading the nation in virus growth, and it was uh, relying on a couple things. It relied on the fact that in the case of North Dakota, we were very low before. So if you're low and the rest of the nation is going down and we're going up uh, <clears throat> still at, at very uh, good levels, like the 5% level, uh, then you have to stop talking about positivity rates uh, and rely on, on primarily on per capita. It didn't mention in the story that North Dakota was doing four to five times more testing uh, than some of our neighbors. Uh, and it did mention in the national story that South Dakota has 17% positive rate, but it did not mention North Dakota's rate, which we just talked about, uh, which is in the low 5% range. <clears throat> uh, but I think this context is important to explaining it. And we've got a few slides that we want to walk through uh, to talk about this math. And the first is that if you're going to compare cases per capita, and I mentioned this in response to a question last week, you can, it's only comparable if each state had the same level of testing. Because if you were doing the same amount of testing per capita, then you could compare the amount of po the positive outcomes per capita. So an example is if state number one did 1,000 tests, it was 5%, you'd have 50. If state the next beat, state B, was doing five times as much testing, 5,000 tests, they had the same positivity rate, uh, they would be identifying 250 cases. So on a, if the population, if you normalize that on, on a per capita basis, state B uh, would look like they're having uh, more of an outbreak when in fact they may just be doing a better job of testing. So to continue that on, you know, without this context of explaining the variations in testing program, you know, new cases per capita can paint an incomplete picture. And we certainly do take a look at, at, at per capita even here in North Dakota, but when we look at per capita by county, we also look at how much testing is going on in that county uh, to make sure that we're, that we're being accurate. And then we also, as part of our work, if we have a, a low population county with a few cases that might skew that, uh, then we look at that differently. And certainly in the case of the U.S. with uh, North Dakota representing uh, one third of 1% of the population of our country, then the, uh, the, the few cases that we have here in North Dakota, uh, uh, you know, are, have been, I think, used to try to skew a national story, which the national story is really that the number of cases have dropped by over 25,000 per day in the last few months. So let's keep our eye on that. Uh, when uh, we... We, the other thing which we want to take a look at too when we talk about growth, if we've been at 1% or 2% and we go to 5%, we could be uh, leading in, in, uh, in the virus growth, if you will. But our positivity rate now at 5%, uh, let's remember, was just only a few months ago when New York and Arizona uh, they were you know, declaring victory on the way down from 20% uh, in the case of, of Arizona for a while. New York in early April had a seven-day rolling average positivity rate of 48%. Uh, when when they got below 10 is when people started thinking about opening up and five was victory. Uh, we're just, we've done such a good job in North Dakota of having low rates all summer that I'm sure 5% is, is high. And like I said, a trend line, if it's going up, we want to make sure we're stopping the spread, but I want everyone in North Dakota to feel great about their effort because uh, again, compared to virtually every other state, uh, whether it's uh, the, the testing, the positivity rate, uh, or the, you know, hospitalizations, fatality, North North Dakota is doing extremely well. This morning, we were pleased to hear that uh, the U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary, Secretary of a for HHS at the national level, Alex Azar, was on a local statewide radio show and complimenting uh, what he said uh, was an incredible testing system and regimen here in North Dakota. And and again, as Secretary Azar noted, there are two real roles to testing. One is diagnostics, which is if someone is sick, they come in, they say, hey, I'm nervous about what I have. Could you give me a test? They get tested, uh, and it turns out if they've got COVID, then they, you're able, we're able to treat it and help save lives. The other kind of testing is surveillance testing, like what we're doing when we, uh, with back to school testing with college students, which is we you know, wanted to know uh, as students were entering the campus, even though no one might have been feeling 
uh, ill, how many of them were potentially uh, asymptomatic uh, spreaders so that we could help protect uh, those in their families, those in the community and those around them. And, and, and as we're doing surveillance testing and we're doing it quite well, uh, it's why we were the, the second highest per capita testing rate in the nation behind uh, New York. And also, again, uh, the White House, which we're working very closely with, we had another phone call with Dr. Burks uh, along, and that was uh, with uh, <clears throat> our staff and Chris Jones and Tammy Miller talking to her last Saturday. Uh, tracking the White House recommendations, uh, which again, conducting weekly testing in our long-term care, which is now the national standard. We've been doing that for since last spring, but now CMS is uh, recommending that. Uh, utilizing the universities for testing, which is another recommendation coming out of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. We're working with UND on plans to uh, install a Hologic Panther machine at UND labs, and we're also working with NDSU's veterinary lab, uh, which will be able to do uh, human uh, specimens. We'll get these labs will get certified. They'll be able to validate specimens. And also we're looking at doing some three to one test pooling at NDSU. We've also engaged students uh, from uh, UND and NDSU uh, from healthcare curriculums to get involved in assisting with contact tracing. And then we're also, uh, which is another federal recommendation, uh, working with NDSU, uh, Department of Environmental Quality at the state level and North Dakota Department of Health uh, doing wastewater testing research, and that's underway in our three largest metro areas, Fargo, Grand Forks, and Bismarck. Results are still being uh, analyzed, but that could be a useful tool for more broad-scale surveillance. <clears throat> And uh, again, as the White House had recommended, we're continuing to, to take a look at and adjust coronavirus risk levels for highly affected communities, which brings us to the next topic, which is the county risk level update. I'll kick off this section by saying that today we're not making any changes to the uh, <clears throat> to the current risk levels that we announced uh, uh, just about 10 days ago. Uh, and as you'll recall, we began using those county by county risk levels on Friday, September 4th. Uh, we're continuing to monitor the 14 day rolling averages. And while we're not making any changes, we do have a couple of counties that are that we're putting a particular eye on uh, that are, have a combination of, of a high number of active cases and uh, and now high relative to the rest of the state uh, positivity rates uh, with with good solid testing. And so those, uh, the two that are in the top of our list here uh, are Stark County and Williams County. These both were moved uh, to the uh, yellow category or moderate risk uh, 10 days ago. Uh, but Stark County with 249 cases and a 10.6% positivity rate and Williams County with 171 cases and 9.6%. Uh, uh, again, uh, areas where we are saying we want to keep an eye on it. We want it, we're going to strongly encourage those counties and the cities within them, uh, and we'll be reaching out to each of them in the days ahead here, uh, discuss their level of local coordination. We know that the local uh, level of uh, coordination and readiness has varied across the state. We know that some counties last spring uh, worked with the cities and their universities and school districts and set up teams or task forces. Uh, and then some of those during the summer uh, got put on hold. Uh, and so we'll be having a discussion on whether or not they want to, what level of local coordination, including whether they should set up a task force if they want to decide to do that. And particularly we're interested in working with them as they develop a plan to see if they need any help with state resources. So as the counties and the cities and the school districts and the universities in these communities work together with their local public health and with the local health providers, uh, <clears throat> as they come together, if they're short of resources, uh, we're going to be ready and willing to help out and to support them. And again, we'll be doing this through our Department of Emergency Services, through the Department of Health, uh, with our, our incredible National Guard uh, members, which as of today, there's 332 soldiers uh, that are out there today uh, helping with this uh, pandemic. 
uh, but we would stand ready to uh, help each of them as they work forward. But again, we're encouraging uh, any county that has got uh, you know, triple digit actives uh, should be thinking about whether or not they need to do a higher level of coordination. And again, we'll be reaching out to each of them. We also want to, some of the counties that, that are, that have uh, increasing percent uh, of positivity also include and border or share geography with our tribal nations and will continue as we have throughout this to stay coordinated with our the tribal leadership to see whatever additional assistance they may need. Uh, <clears throat> next topic is the updated smart restart guidance. As you might remember, this was a, the smart restart guidance had to do primarily with commercial businesses. Uh, this was worked on in conjunction with our Department of Health and our Department of Commerce and input from dozens of different uh, industry groups when we built this uh, and we did that last spring. Uh, we're updating those as we committed that we would regularly do. And one of the things that we're doing uh, on those guidelines is to place additional emphasis on the importance of face coverings or masks as a mitigation measure. And if for businesses that are in the moderate uh, or risk, you know, the yellow counties uh, that necessitate or higher, if you're in the yellow or higher, then it necessitates on-site work that might put people face-to-face -face with uh, customers. The guidelines, again, these are guidelines, not mandates, but the guidelines within the updated smart research now recommend uh, that, uh, you know, pre-screening and monitoring employees for symptoms, uh, complying with social distancing guidelines wherever possible. We're not uh, requiring the use of masks and of course following the cleaning uh, guidelines. Uh, and again, the reason why we're doing this is because uh, we know from the data from around the rest of the country that masks work uh, as a way to slow the spread. And we also know that for those that are interested in keeping our schools open, keeping our businesses open, for those that uh, care about freedom and liberty, the least restrictive thing that people can do is to voluntarily uh, wear a mask uh, because this is a way that we can, again, doesn't require a <clears throat> any significant uh, spending at the state or federal level. Uh, and again, for business owners, they may find this is a, a smart way to protect their workforce because by masking, you may be able to keep people on the job as opposed to have them uh, contract COVID and be quarantined or isolated for 10 to 14 days and lose that workforce. So again, this is a, a great thing for your employees, a great thing for your customers, and a great thing for all the vulnerable around the state that we're trying to protect. And it's also for commercial businesses uh, to engage. We've seen a number of national commercial businesses, including all the big box retailers, require this of their team members and they require it of customers. Uh, it seems like their business is doing, many of them are doing gangbuster business business with these uh, with uh, national requirements. They're doing that because they know as, a, as employers, in some case, some of the big box employers employ more people uh, nationwide than we have citizens in our state. Uh, one of them, it's more than 2X, more than citizens in our state. Uh, and they have found that by requiring masks for their team members is a way to keep their stores open and their businesses strong. So again, uh, our path towards freedom is to do the things that are the least restrictive. And so this is a guideline. Uh, and again, recommend the recommendation changes in the updated, the updated smart restart guidance uh, includes uh, recommending that businesses that are in these moderate risk or yellow areas or higher uh, that there are require the use of masks for their team members and that they uh, recommend them strongly for their customers. Okay, that's all on that topic. Uh, we next is the Main Street uh, Summit. In the Main Street uh, Summit, which is scheduled for October 6th and 7th, it's the perfect opportunity for us to have a statewide virtual conversation about our future and resiliency. We know that this COVID is changing uh, how people commute, how people work, uh, what office uh, environments are going to look like, uh, and where people live, uh, and, and what space is required uh, to uh, achieve uh, distancing in some cases. So with a focus on building resilience, communities. Uh, this conference will be held in partnership with the Economic Development Association of North Dakota, the North Dakota Council of the Arts, and Prairie Family Business. So thank you to those sponsors. Uh, we'll have a number of keynotes from around the country uh, <clears throat> and 
that'll, that'll share their experience and knowledge on how to build resilient, healthy, and vibrant communities. A couple of those include the Transformational Community Leadership Podcast veterans, Dennis uh, Frazee and Jason Hutchinson uh, from the organization called Develop This. Uh, we'll also have some top educational and comprehensive breakout sessions, special guest appearances from North Dakota uh, regional artists and uh, including Jesse Veter and Chuck Succi and others. Uh, and registration is now open. It's only 20 bucks at MainStreetSummitND.com. That's $20 at MainStreetSummit.nd. MainStreetSummitND.com. Uh, first 500 registrants, uh, that could be you right now, first 500 receive a Main Street Summit gift in the mail. So reserve your spot now. If you're one of the first 500, uh, you'll get this free gift. Uh, the conference provides opportunities, community leaders, students, prof and professional economic developers an opportunity to attend one of the largest community development events in the region. For more information and to register, you can visit uh, msnd.link slash 2020. Uh, and again, uh, there will be, well, it is virtual, there will be live uh, presentations, uh, including uh, including a, a number of, of uh, folks and a number of state agencies are gonna be participating in this from uh, DOT uh, to Commerce, uh, to the Health Department, uh, to you name it, uh, we'll have a strong presence from the state of North Dakota there to help all of our communities become more resilient. The next uh, topic is behavioral health update. Uh, last week I signed a proclamation identifying September as Suicide Prevention Month in North Dakota, calling on residents to know the signs, identify who's at risk and be prepared to help. Uh, we touched on this briefly last week, but uh, since we're still in the month of September, I wanted to go uh, even a little deeper into this important topic. In 2019, Sadly, 134 of our fellow North Dakotans died by suicide. But even more shockingly and maybe less well known, there was 1,194 suicide attempts. Uh, the suicide rate in North Dakota is 25% higher than the national average, and that's uh, certainly not, that's certainly a cause for concern. But there is no single cause for suicide. However, most often occurs when stressors and health issues converge to create an experience of hopelessness and despair. Risk factors and, and, and characteristics or conditions include uh, could include stressful life events, whether it's rejection, divorce, financial crisis, bullying. Uh, other life transitions or loss. Conditions like depression, anxiety, substance abuse, especially when unaddressed, dramatically increase the risk for suicide. Uh, North Dakota data suggests that individuals at highest risk include males, uh, Native Americans, older adults, veterans, those living in rural areas, and LGBTQ youth and adults. Uh, you can be the difference in getting someone the help they need when they're struggling emotionally or have a hard time, have a hard time. And these are just five simple steps. But the first one is one which I know people are often nervous about if they think that someone is struggling and they are concerned about asking the basic question, are you thinking about suicide? Uh, all of the professionals in this space say this is absolutely the right question to just get it out on the table and, and expose that, that hidden thought. So just number one, if you're concerned about someone, just ask them, are you thinking about suicide? Number two, keep them safe. Establish their immediate safety. Uh, and this could be a number of things to, to, to do to make sure that they're in a safe place and away from things that might cause them harm. But I guess the, number, the third thing is tied to that, which is be there. Be physically present for someone. Uh, and if you can't be physically present, see if you can get someone else who can, if you're distant from them, maybe someone call someone who's nearby or a, a neighbor that can go be with them. Or, and then in the meantime, just keep speaking with them on the phone. And then help them connect. Connect them with community resources and professionals. And then lastly, follow up to see how they're doing. Suicide is a preventable public health problem and when you, you can be the difference in getting uh, someone the help they need, you can visit behavioralhealth.nd.gov to learn more about the five steps you can take uh, to help save a life or at any time, seven by 24, no charge, 1-800-273-TALK uh, to speak to someone, whether it's about your, ish your concerns, your feelings, your emotions, or whether that's someone in, in your life that you're worried about, 1-800-273-TALK.
Next topic is the census update. This is another uh, one of, I'd say, good news and bad news. Uh, but the Census Bureau is conducting door-to-door -door enumeration, meaning they're coming around to count, or do, and, and the people knocking on your door are enumerators. Uh, when they'll continue vi you know, visiting and whose doors they're knocking on, they're knocking on the households that have not responded to the 2020 census. Uh, they're physically vi visiting non-response household with the intent of getting them to fill out the census. 74% of non-responding households have now been visited. And, and so again, if you're uh, one of those households that has not responded, the chances of you being visited yet, if you haven't been already, is nearly 100% if you haven't filled out the, 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 uh, the form. And, uh, and so if you want to reduce the chances of someone uh, visiting your door, uh, you know, during COVID or any time uh, during the census, go online right now. It takes only a few minutes. So my2020census.gov and you can, can respond without the code that was sent to your house. But if you do have that code, that'll make things easier and quicker. Uh, but I've gone through this myself and it literally can just take, uh, take a very short period of time. Uh, for those people in North Dakota that may have a, uh, a second home or a lake home or a cabin in the Badlands. If that's not your full-time residence, someone may be coming and try to knock there on the, door, on the door as well. And you can also go on the my2020census.gov and indicate that no one lives at that residence. Uh, you can also, if you don't want to have access to being online, you can call 844 uh, and and talk to them. Uh, you can also just complete and mail back the paper questionnaire. But let's talk about how we're doing. I think we had a slide up here that showed our results. Uh, Burley County uh, is not only leading in COVID, they're also leading in uh, the number of people that have, that have fulfilled the census, 77.7%. Morton County second at 70.9%. Stutzman County at 70.8%. But let's flip to the other end. Uh, so North Dakota is, our self-response rate was slightly lower than the national average and we're behind where we were in 2010 when we know we had an undercount. And why does undercounting matter? Because if we get undercounted, uh, it's over uh, $60,000 over the next 10, 10 year period that would come into the state per individual. And this helps pay for roads, for schools, for nutrition, for health programs. So being counted really matters. Uh, the most severely undercounted areas in the state are rural and western counties as well as those counties which share geography with our tribal nations but <clears throat> this is a would be a devastating loss of federal uh, support dollars for programs in the next 10 years if we don't get these up but roulette county response rate 31.8 percent mckinsey county 33.1 sioux county 34.6 montreal county 35.9 benson county 36.8 and divide county 41.3 so again, we got some work to do. Uh, if you're in one of those counties or if you have not filled out your form uh, or if you're unsure if you have, you can still go to my2020census.gov and check to see if your information is complete. Next topic is National Preparedness Month. <clears throat> And uh, well, it may seem like we've been in a kind of a continual uh, state of emergency for the past three years, moving from one uh, emergency to another. Uh, we do want everybody to know that uh, North Dakota uh, is observing National Preparedness Month. Uh, it's held each September. It's divine, designed to promote family and community disaster planning now and throughout the year. The theme is disasters don't wait, make your plan uh, today. Uh, and again, we know that, uh, that even during the COVID-19 pandemic, on top of that, we can have natural disasters and emergencies can occur as we're seeing in other parts of the country. Uh, so North Dakotans knowing, know from experience that taking steps to prepare ahead of time can help you respond more efficiently and safely during an emergency, uh, especially uh, during our, our periods of time when we've got challenging weather. And uh, the, in the fact, the, the state of North Dakota uh, is helping out some other states right now. Uh, and while we, we don't have... Uh, 
hurricanes or earthquakes here, at least so far in North Dakota. Uh, we know that other parts of the nation uh, have been dealing with that, and now they're dealing with devastating wildfires on the West Coast. Uh, the North Dakota is responding through a Emergency Management Assistance Compact, or EMAC, if you're familiar with that, E-M-A-C. Uh, it's a mechanism that allows states to send personnel, equipment, supplies to assist with the response and recovery in other states. And uh, North Dakota's got a long history of being uh, someone who stands up and helps when other parts of the nation are in are challenged. And since 2005, our, our DES, our Department of Emergency Service staff, have supported response uh, agencies, to including uh, things like Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, uh, <clears throat> volcanoes in Hawaii and most recently Oklahoma last year for flooding and tornadoes. Those are just a few of the examples. But now we're sending a firefighter task force to Oregon. State of Oregon made the request. It's comprised of uh, 12 firefighters and one task force leader. Uh, the, the leaders coming from Williston, Grand Forks, and Fargo in Williston are providing uh, the uh, the personnel. The team is gonna bring three fire trucks and two support vehicles. Uh, they reported today to the North Dakota Forest Service Firehouse in Bismarck for coordinating instructions and to be issued additional equipment. Uh, they'll leave today. If they haven't already, they'll be boots on the ground in Oregon for the next 14 days. North Dakota's teams, of course, are trained in urban firefighting, so you may ask yourself, uh, why would they be going to fight forest fires? But they're gonna be located at a base camp in Oregon where they'll operate their engines to protect uh, structures, uh, it, which would be more typical of urban firefighting, protect communities and homes and buildings from advancing wildfires. There's currently 38 active wildfires threatening several communities in Western Oregon, and our hearts go out to the families and all those uh, that have been impacted by this devastation, including and especially those families uh, who've got a family member who's either perished or is is missing right now during this uh, during these uh, fires. Fires. Uh, so again, back to, to back to the, our prepared month. Again, want to thank those firefighters for representing North Dakota. Want to thank them for all they do here. But as we come back to uh, preparedness month, there are four things that anybody can do: make a plan, build a kit, prepare for disasters, and teach youth about preparedness. Talk to your kids about preparing for emergencies, uh, and and have a plan. But I encourage all North Dakotans to learn more about these four steps at ndresponse.gov. Again, disasters don't wait. So make your plan today and can be a fun uh, family activity. <laughs> Next piece of good news, uh, NDDOT receives a build grant. Uh, we mentioned this before, uh, but uh, again, uh, shout out to our director of, of DOT, North Dakota DOT, Bill Panos and his team for being all over on top of uh, applying for these federal grants and putting in great grant applications because we know these are, are, uh, don't always, aren't always awarded, so good work to them for receiving this. But over the past 20 years in North Dakota as we've been in this prolonged wet cycle, uh, there have been over 350 grade raise projects or rip rack projects on North Dakota State Highways. Of those 350 projects, 237, they weren't planned, they were emergency repairs, which may have only been a temporary solution until a permanent grade raise could be constructed. And several roadways across the state, again, are in danger of undergoing uh, of going underwater, uh, anybody that's traveling uh, across the state, uh, east to west or north to south knows where some of these are and knows that, that again, uh, this year there was real challenges around many parts of the state in terms of road grades. But this spring, the NDDOT applied for a build grant. Today we were notified that we awarded $22 million uh, grant uh, to raise the grade in 13 different locations across the central and eastern part of the state. Uh, and again, this instead of doing emergency we can do permanent raised grades, uh, which again is a great way to build resilience for future high water moments. But we'll, uh, we'll be able to protect these roadways from going underwater, increase the safety for the traveling public. So again, congratulations to NDDOT on that $22 million grant. In the, uh, <clears throat> under the gratitude section, we've got another story of, uh, that I guess I would call good news, but gratitude. Gratitude here uh, goes out to all of our, not only our law enforcement officers, both when they're on duty, but when they're off duty. 
Uh, last Saturday morning, a medical emergency occurred at the MDU Community Resources Bowl, uh, which is for those uh, statewide that haven't been there, that's the beautiful stadium here that shared by a number of, of uh, collegiate and high school and youth teams uh, here in the Bismarck Mandan area, but it was opening day of Bismarck Youth Football Day. An elderly gentleman from Bismarck collapsed as he entered the fan seating area to watch his grandson uh, play uh, youth football. Off-duty highway patrolman and recently promoted to lieutenant from sergeant, and I would also say a good friend of mine, Steve Johnson, uh, ran to the victim when he saw him fall, uh, quickly determined that he was suffering from a cardiac arrest. Uh, Off-duty Bismarck police officer George Huff, who was there as a coach, was leading his youth team in pre-games warm-up, uh, rushed to the man's assistant. Another off-duty North Dakota Highway Patrolman, Sergeant Derek Arndt, ran to his vehicle to retrieve his AED. And I'd say thank you to the legislature and others for making sure that we've got uh, automated defibrillator devices in each of our patrol cars. Uh, he retrieved that, had it hooked up uh, to the, uh, the gentleman within a couple of minutes. Johnson and Huff teamed up to administer chest, chest compressions between multiple AED shocks. Uh, the individual was revived. Other coaches and fans assisted in emergency response. Several other off-duty police officers assisted in crowd control, including helping to calm young children who had witnessed the incident. Um, later, a relative of the man uh, reported that medical personnel were confident that the first aid response of the AED and the chest compressions had truly saved his life. And I think for all of us, this is just a great reminder, uh, particularly during these times uh, when there have been uh, <clears throat> so many... Uh, such a challenging environment for people to work in law enforcement. It's a great environment that here in North Dakota, our law enforcement officers are out there every day working to protect the public and save lives. And whether they're on duty uh, or whether they're off duty, and they may be just there coaching their kids or watching their kids, uh, they don't hesitate to spring into action when someone's life is in danger. So thank you, Lieutenant Johnson, Sergeant Arndt, and Officer Huff for your swift and life-saving response. Uh, we know that you represent uh, the spirit of all the law enforcement in our state, and we're grateful for your service, your professionalism, and your representation of the state and community. And in closing, uh, gratitude quote uh, from an uh, American author and uh Amy Collette said, gratitude is a powerful catalyst for happiness. It's the spark that lights a fire of joy in your soul. And again, uh, I would just say again, deep gratitude for our law enforcement. Uh, and they literally were lighting a spark uh, that, 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 that reunited a soul last week. So again, uh, thank you to all of our great law enforcement. We'll be back here uh, next Wednesday. We've got a full week of constitutional meetings and uh, presidential uh, briefings and other things so it's a challenging time so we'll invite your flexibility next week we'll have our first morning press conference the only time that we can get it worked in next week but next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, will be our first morning press briefing uh, Wednesday September 23rd after that we'll hope to return to these afternoon slots but uh, that's the best time we can make it work uh, across a number of different conflict. So until then, uh, remember to be uh, North Dakota smart and help, help us save lives and livelihoods. So with that, we'll uh, stand for questions. And again, thank you all for being here. I guess we're going uh, left before we go right. So Jack and then Jeremy and then Jacob. You wouldn't mind, Governor, I'd like to go back in time a bit. Uh, in January 2018, you said you would absolutely support a primary seatbelt law in North Dakota, and the legislature last year considered but defeated this bill um, amid arguments of personal freedom. One representative said in a floor debate, should we continue to erode our freedoms by choice by making this a primary offense? How was your decline to issue a mask mandate different than your support of a primary seatbelt law when personal freedom and responsibility are arguments in both debates? Well, uh, I would just say that I'm going to stand by both of those decisions, and maybe maybe there's a, some theoretical conflict in holding those two views. Uh, but I, I would say that the the data is very, very strong for seatbelt saving lives. And I also know that uh, when a life ends in a death in a car accident, it's immediate, it's violent, uh, it is 
you talk to any anybody who's lost someone, or you know anybody who's lost somebody in a uh, car accident, uh, it's you know ir irreversible. Uh, in many cases, and even if people live, they can have serious injuries. You know, that can change their change their life. And the people that that have to come upon those are the public servants are that I was just talking about. Whether it's our highway patrolmen, talk to anybody in the North Dakota highway patrolmen. At some point in their career, they've come across a fatal accident, and and the people would have lived if they just had worn a seatbelt. And so you say to yourself, okay, is this something where we can? Um, uh, not have any cost on the individual. Uh, does it, cars all come equipped with seat belts? They didn't 30 years ago. I mean, now they all have they all have seat belts, and so it seems to me like this is a, a well established, uh, you know, well established science that's been around. I mean, this seat belt research started in the 1970s, so it's gone on for 50 years. And North Dakota, we're just on the tail end of this of, of, of sort of understanding that. And and again, uh, the that and when you have a seatbelt law that as it's been written in the past and and I would encourage the legislature to to propose one again under vision zero it's supported by the the, the uh, highway department it's supported by the the highway patrol it's supported by the you know all the workforce safety uh, there are many corporations where their drivers drive for a living virtually all those corporations have re seatbelt requirements uh, and so again this is a, a seems like a bit of a no-brainer, uh, you know, based on everything that's that's there. So I, I hope that we can move that way because, again, it would be nice to go through uh, a month in our state's history without having any deaths from auto accidents. You know, we're still close to over 100 a year uh, that die, uh, and in virtually all those cases, they're, they're, they could have been preventable if people had had a, a seatbelt on. Now, you try to connect that with masks. Uh, you know, if <clears throat> if I'm you know, sitting in my driveway and not going anywhere and wearing a seatbelt, I'm not helping anybody else, okay? But if, but if, I'm, uh, if I'm putting a mask on and going into public, I'm helping other people. And so this is a different thing. This is a community thing. This is a we're all in it together. It's not just about who's behind the wheel and who's moving. Uh, this is about a, a virus that can only live and only transport itself, you know, in human bodies. And 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 I, I think again that we we don't see the efficacy of of having a mandate on mask increasing compliance. It might actually do the opposite in North Dakota. So we're trying to slow the spread. We're not trying to increase government. We're trying to be you know, pragmatic and smart and understand this. And there was a recent study that just actually came out that actually said that, that the, 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 the fallacy of trying to say, well, these states did this. These states had these mandates. Well, the states that had those mandates and had high compliance probably had a majority of the people that wanted the state to have a mask mandate. We're in a state where the majority of people don't want to have a mask mandate. And so it's all, it's all contextual relative to the, uh, the, the context of the, the situation that you're operating in. And so that's why, again, trying to say that you, if you, a uniform, uniformly applying things across the, the breadth of our country doesn't make any sense. That's, again, it's a beautiful thing that we've got 50 states and we can have 50 cauldrons of democracy or 50 platforms of in, innovation. And we're gonna continue to do in North Dakota with a thing that we think saves the most lives and saves the most livelihoods. You know, this dual goal that we have, we're not just focused on one, we're focused on a dual goal, and and for for not, for not having that here probably makes sense because if I thought if I thought by not having a seatbelt law that we could get more people to wear their seatbelt, I'd be that's the camp I'd be in because I'm for in both cases I'm for compliance. It's just two different methods to get to the same place. Okay, Jeremy. <clears throat> Governor, Cass County has seen a, a pretty sizable increase in new and active cases over the last three days specifically, um, and the county now meets the criteria of a moderate risk uh, county enrolling average active cases and positivity rate over the last two weeks. Um, why isn't that county moving up to yellow? Well, I'd say there's a couple different things that go into that. One is that it, they're, I'd say, more on the on the bubble. We said we're going to use judgment. Uh, we talked about Stark and Williams being close to 10 or above 10. Uh, Cass County is uh, 
close to five, just over five. So their, their rate is half the rate. Uh, their rate per capita is substantially lower. Uh, and again, as we've seen in both Grand Forks and in Cass County, uh, we've got a higher percentage of of the positives are in that 18 to 29 age group. Uh, and you get into, uh, you know, Burley, Morton and Stark, some of these counties, we've got a lot of people who are positive that are 70 and older. So the risk levels are different in terms of what can lead to hospitalization and death. And those are things that we look at. Uh, you know, if CAS keeps climbing the way it is, they'll probably be, would be considered a candidate uh, to move up. But They've all, they're also doing a, a, a lot of testing. We did have a uh, you know, great effort last Saturday. I think close to 1,000 NDSU students were tested last uh, Saturday, uh, which was our largest campus testing, uh, you know, and great support from the university and the student leaders and uh, the, the university president and getting the word out and getting people to show up for testing. So you know, that's, we're trying to look at the, uh, the data that underlines the, 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 underlines the top level numbers to really see, but in particular, uh, where the case spread by age uh, is something we're looking at because that's gonna determine uh, whether we're gonna get pressure on hospitalization or not. But thank you for following the numbers so closely. Uh, Jacob? Going along those lines, uh, you recommended the mask being worn for some counties that have been moved or are in moderate, uh, but it's just a recommendation. Meanwhile, you have a request for proposal out for $1.8 million to a agency to create some PSAs and whatnot for COVID initiatives and whatnot. I'm assuming the effectiveness of mask wearing is going to be included in those PSAs. $1.8 million seems like a lot of money for something you could require for free. Well, I think, again, you could require something and, and have less compliance, uh, you know, versus try to educate people and have more compliance. And I think we're, we're a, when we focus on individual responsibility, part of the way people can make a choice on whether they see it as a, you know, infringement on their own rights or do they see it as a way to give back positively to their community, their neighbors, their families. And so it turns out we've tried a lot of different ways of encouraging uh, things. Some of that has uh, been, as you say, free. Uh, it's, but I think whether it's, a, when you take a look at public health over the last uh, 30, 40 years, when we've really moved the dial on things that matter for public health, whether it's like smoking, uh, you know, there have been you know, tens of millions of dollars were spent on anti-smoking campaigns and targeted at, at youth, and they were relatively effective until vaping came along, and then we had a resurgence. But uh, the, you know, the, the anti-meth campaigns, which ran, including in our neighboring state in Montana and others, uh, where lots of money was spent, but they were effective in helping educate people about the real dangers. Uh, the, the federal government, of course, provides uh, money through public health programs for one of the, one of the elements, uh, long-standing elements of public health is public education so this fits in line with that and we're you know choosing to spend a, a small uh, portion I guess this is about two tenths of one percent of the of the money that we got to the coronavirus relief funds on the and an educational component and it again would seem to make sense in a state where we know that uh, mask mandates at a state level are not in are likely in our future uh, that this is a way to try to help educate uh, people about the about the benefits because there is uh, what's also free is misinformation and there is literally you know hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars of misinformation on the, on the, uh, on the internet uh, on the other side of this. And so, you know, whether or not, I guess the question is not, uh, is, is can you do a campaign that is, has the, the breadth and the reach across our state? Uh, we'd like to try to do it efficiently and do it on social media, do it in a targeted way uh, and, and see if we can be smart about how we do it. But I, I think it's a good, good investment. I'm going to keep going around, so I'm going Dave, and then we're going, we're going counterclockwise back to Tom. Or I guess clockwise, excuse me. <clears throat> Governor, on the census, isn't time really running out very quickly in order to get this accomplished? It is, and I'd have to refresh on the, uh, the deadline. I also think there was uh, some court action where people are trying to push that uh, deadline back further, and so... Uh, Dave will follow up with you and get you that. But uh, initially, yeah, we were running up against a uh, uh, October, end of October deadline. For, and for those counties that were in the 30% range, that's not much time. Lane? 
Governor, I was just curious if North Dakota is uh, using the rapid testing anywhere in the state, and if so, what is it necessarily being used for, or who is using it? Uh, and before I answer that question for all of those uh, Viking fans or that are used to their usual season disappointment at the beginning uh, that Lane, Lane's wearing a Green Bay Packers jersey uh, here today. Uh, but the rapid testing, uh, we, have, we have received some shipments of the, of the, of the testing from Quidel and Bechtel Dickinson. Uh, these were the $25 per, per test uh, that were talked about at the national level in early August. Uh, some of those have been shipped to nursing homes. Uh, we are following up this week to see if we're on the list or about ready to receive some of the $5, but even more accurate, uh, Binox, the Abbott, the $5 15-minute test. We do have enough capacity. I mean, and the, and the federal strategy for distributing those tests was to try to get them out to all of the long-term care facilities in the country, and they were focusing on skilled nursing. North Dakota was ahead of the nation because we were already doing testing at assisted living, basic care, and skilled nursing, and we had the capacity to do it with the PCR tests through our lab. Other states weren't getting the testing done, didn't have the capacity, so the, these tests were meant to be a low-cost, high-capacity way to try to fill that gap. When we talked to Dr. Brooks on Saturday and we indicated, hey, if we have enough capacity to keep doing what we're doing at a, at a better and higher rate than what now the CMS, which is the part of human health and human services, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, the CMS, that they, that they were now requiring for long-term care. If we could do that, could we repurpose the rapid test to another, another thing? And she said, absolutely. So some obvious things come to mind. One would be testing for visitors coming into long-term care. Uh, another could be uh, for for using as a rapid tool, if say we had an outbreak in a school building where you could go in and test a lot of people quickly and get the results and say, okay, these are the positives, these are the negatives, um, and, and, and then sort people, uh, if you will, by you know sort of who's, who's got a quarantine and who can stay in school. So I, I think there's a number of ways those rapid tests are real game changers for us, but they have not yet been deployed and there aren't any of them in, there in our numbers yet, but soon. And as I've said before, uh, I, I think again for as our nation looks for something hopeful, if, if we got the capacity for some of these manufacturers to produce 50 million tests a year uh, and, and distribute these, this is, this is going to be uh, a, could be something that could help get stadiums filled again and could help get concerts going again, could help a number of things going again because of a, a $5 test uh, added to a ticket price for events, uh, you know, probably is in the price range where it could start to be, uh, start to really be effective as a way to, to uh, ensure that everybody in a large gathering were all negative at that point in time. Okay, online. Scott Hennon, WZFG and KFYR Radio. You've always said your focus is on pr protecting the vulnerable. Now college kids seem to be more of the focus. Are you testing enough in long-term care? Uh, for Scott, the co college kids are the focus because of the, <clears throat> they're, they're, they have the potential to be asymptomatic spreaders and because of their high a uh, high number of transmissible moments that they're, they're, they're going through and because we've also got college kids uh, that work in college, nursing students and others that are also working in long-term care facilities, as I said. So us understanding the level of spread in the community is really important for us to, to help manage uh, the manage it within the long-term care facilities. And where we've seen places in the counties where we've seen higher percent positive rates and higher case rates, that's where we're also seeing things show up in terms of the challenges that we're having in long-term care. So, you know, the focus hasn't changed. It is about protecting the most vulnerable, but having surveillance strategy testing for, for those that have contact with with the most vulnerable as opposed to, uh, as opposed to the most vulnerable directly is a, is a one way that we're going to get at that in a very comprehensive way. We'll do one more online and then we'll circle over to Tom. Uh, Gene Shemp, Hometown Radio Group. Because unique individuals and serial tests are two distinct groups of people, wouldn't it make sense on a statewide and national level to track the positivity rates from both groups separately, especially now that more states are conducting serial testing? And would this help 
and the debate on how to track positivity rates? Uh, the, the quick answer uh, on that is, uh, in my mind is no uh, for Gene on that is because the tracking the positivity rate on the total tests we take in a day makes complete sense. Tracking it only on unique individuals, uh, it, the only way I've been able to describe it in which we finally were I guess able to get through with the COVID tracking project is it's it's a it's the it's the math that would not allow you to get out of third grade or fourth grade because in that case we would be when we're just doing unique individuals but we had a, if we had a positive showed up in someone that was being serial tested they wanted to count the positive in the numerator but not count it in the denominator and so and that's where we we ended up with these really uh, inaccurate readings because it wasn't reflecting the level of the comprehensive testing we were doing so we're reporting it and we'll continue to report it we were reporting it two ways unique and total we now have a new thing called test encounters which we're reporting which will be slightly lower than total tests uh, because on test encounters in other states in other states, there were people that might have been getting a rapid test in the morning, and then if it was positive, they were getting rechecked with a PCR test in the afternoon. So they were having two tests in one day. Uh, they didn't want to double count those because uh, it was one individual with two tests on the same day. We understand that. So the, there is very little of that happening in North Dakota, but we are now reporting separately what's called test encounters, which is slightly less than the, the total test. But running the positivity numbers off of Total tests or total encounters is a way to accurately reflect the level of spread that, that you would have in a in any in a given community, and we'll stick with that. Uh, and again, very few states are reporting unique individuals. We started doing that early on, and that's where some of the confusion came because maybe we were overly transparent because people grabbed that number, which was a denominator almost 40% lower than our total testing, and that's what was dramatically skewing the positivity rates on some sites, including it's still, it's still tracked inaccurately on COVID Act now, and a number of other sites are still pulling the wrong data, but we've got a SWAT team and we're working through through all these volunteer uh, data gathering sites uh, to make sure that they, we can get them to all be accurate along with ours. That'll make it easier for all the professionals that are here every day and those listening in. Okay, Tom. Yeah, but I wanna drill down a little bit on some people that are really affected in the west part of the state, namely the students and parents uh, uh, of, of students that are going to District 8 and District 1. They had a lot to deal with in just the last few days. Williston High School football has been benched for two weeks because of COVID. Um, they have a protest scheduled for tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at the high school to protest against the mandatory policy on wearing a mask. Uh, they've got a plus 9% positivity rate in the rolling average in the last 14 days. And they've got a very high positivity rate at the, West, at the Williston State College just this last week. So these kids have all this to think about, and the parents have all this to think about. I wonder if the governor has, will we'll take a moment and, and address those families as to uh, what, what you feel in regards to this. Well, I think whether it's Williston or any place in the country, you know, parenting during a time of COVID or being a, a, a student, whether it's a elementary or junior high, high school, or university level, being a student during a time of COVID presents all kinds of challenges. I think it'll be interesting to see 20 years from now in our country, uh, the, the experiences that young people are having today, how that shapes them as leaders, how that shapes them as citizens, how it shapes their desire to, get, to be engaged. Uh, so I think it's gonna be a, a, an influential time in the history of these young people's lives. But I would say to the, the local leadership up there, uh, whether, you know, whether it's the county, the school district, the, the, the city, the, <clears throat> the university, the, everybody working together. I mean, the key, the key thing is doing what, we, what we're doing, what we've always done in North Dakota when you have challenges. And Williston, like any other community, has been through, has shown enormous resilience. They've gone through one of the biggest booms and one of the biggest uh, you know, challenges in terms of downturns of any uh, state in our nation in the history of the state. I mean, what they've gone through in the last five years. And so I've got complete confidence that the city of Williston is gonna come through this stronger than ever. And I imagine the kids will too. But, you know, as somebody that, you know, I was 
you know, I couldn't even concentrate when I was in high school thinking about the next football game. And so, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was what was the complete focus about, particularly if you had a rival coming up or a rival game. And so uh, I really feel for the, for the, where these games are getting canceled for kids that that's a loss. Uh, but I know that they'll get through that as well. And they'll, you know, everybody learns, learns, learns from all this, but I, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure everybody, like I said, come through stronger than before. Up, yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Jack, I'm going to zip around this way because I got another thing they're trying to get me to. Okay, Jack. Um, is the metric for COVID-19 task force to get their 14-day positivity rate below the state's average, is that still a good metric? And why wouldn't a static target be a better goal? Uh, it's, thank you for bringing that up. We did, uh, I forgot to mention that today, but we did make a decision today that the static target would be better. And so the target on all these task forces is to get uh, below 5%. That gets you in the green zone for most all the national reporting areas. And again, I mean, for us to get into that, you know, that, that's a, a good goal for us, particularly with the high amount of testing that we're doing in the state. Jeremy? Uh, Governor, both of the Canadian provinces that border North Dakota have been much more successful in preventing the spread of COVID-19 than really any of their American neighbors, including North Dakota. Um, I know you've spoken in the past with premiers and officials up there. I'm wondering, is there something that they're doing that's working? Um, what have they told you about their response? Well, th this uh, came up in a meeting the other day, and I'm uh, reaching out to them, and I'll be able to give you an answer to that before next Wednesday, because I plan to talk to both <clears throat> in both Manitoba and Saskatchewan again to learn, because uh, the place I'd start is trying to make sure I understand their data and how they're, how they're doing it, what controls they've got in place. But, <clears throat> but again, again the, the, uh, based on the numbers, uh, they're, they're, they're some, there must be some good things going on up in Canada and good, good to learn from our neighbors. Okay, uh, Tom, Tom and then Jacob and then we're done. <clears throat> follow-up. One of your supporters asked, how are you coping? Me personally? You personally. Oh, I, well, I would say the, uh, the, at a time, you know, we, we've been since, since Brent and I took office, Brent Sanford and I took office. I mean, we, when we came into office, we had DAPL was going on for the first 76 days. Then we went into a drought. Then we had hundreds of wildfires, wildfires in Western North Dakota. Uh, then we got into, uh, you know, spring flooding, fall flooding, spring flooding. Uh, so we've had one disaster declaration, one emergency after another. We had the budget crisis where we had to cut $1.7 billion out with the legislature. Uh, now we've had a, you know, a bit of an economic recovery. Now we've had a second collapse uh, in three and a half years. So it's, it's been, uh, you know, the crisis management has been really part of every day we've been here. And I'd like to say that we're, uh, it, we're, the things that we learned in our life prior to taking these jobs and the things that we're, we are doing right now are, you know, maybe everything that led in our lives led us to be prepared to do these moments. So, uh, but I, I appreciate the sentiment of someone asking how we're doing, but, uh, I, you know, Brent and Sandy are doing great. And the first lady and Brent's kids, we're talking about his kids today. They're, he's got kids back in school, you know, one, one at NDSU and two here in school in Bismarck. And they're all, uh, you know, play, doing things, playing football, enjoying school. And uh, the first lady and I are doing great. And, uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm probably happy that while I'm dealing with this, I don't, my parents are both gone, so I don't have to worry about any parents in long-term care and my kids are all uh, <clears throat> uh, either out of college or doing college online by choice and so they're so th I've, I've got very few family worries and I can devote my whole attention to the state and uh, and it, again it, it's an honor to serve and it's particularly an honor to serve when, when during a time of crisis okay Jacob and then we'll be done <laughs> Back to the RFP on the uh, awareness and COVID initiatives and whatnot deal. Uh, contract says that, or the RFP says the contract start date would approximately be today. Just wondering if a firm has been selected and what the price tag on it is. Uh, I don't, uh, not up to speed on the RFP process on that, but we can certainly get you an update or we'll make an announcement if there is one. But. But thank you. Uh, but anyway, thanks everybody for your attendance today. And again, uh, repeating uh, next Wednesday, 10 a.m. Uh, for next week, and then we'll get back on the afternoon schedule after that. But again, thanks everybody for tuning in, uh, and thanks to our media for all of your great work. Appreciate it.